Let's, uh, let's pray as we come and look at the Bible together, shall we? And do keep that open if you've got a Bible in front of you. Lord, thank you that we come to, come to your word. We've just uh, said thanks be to God, and yet this is, this is a challenging passage that affects, uh, affects everything we do. So please speak to us and help us today. Amen. Well, uh, I don't know about you, but over this last year, um, we've had to do a lot, lot of looking forward, haven't we? You know, I'm looking forward to when we can sing again, when we can meet up again. I'm looking forward to when I can go to the pub. I'm looking forward to when I can go shopping. We've all been looking forward a lot over the last year or so. And we've been told to focus on that future so that we do the right thing in the present, haven't we? So, um, so focus on that future that's ahead. Uh, and so get vaccinated now, or wear a mask now, or, or don't see too many people now. So that focus on the future has affected how we live in the present. And that's really the theme of our next few sermons in Luke chapter 12. Uh, they encourage us to look to the future, to be future focused, uh, to live rightly for God in the present. But this future isn't just a couple of months or a couple of years away. Uh, this future is eternity, forever. It involves Jesus' return to judge the world, to bring in God's kingdom fully. That is the future that is in focus in this passage. And as we focus on that future, it will mean we live differently as Christians now. So let me ask you, where is your focus? I've got a pair of binoculars. I think we got them free when we joined National Trust or something like that. They're not very good. Um, especially if I take my glasses off, I might as well not bother because they're just substitute for glasses. But, but you've got this little focus thing in the middle, haven't you? You turn it and uh, you can either focus on things far away, to look far away. But if you're focusing on things far away, what happens to all the stuff nearby? So it's all blurred, isn't it? If you look at something a bit closer, focus it closer, everything far away is blurred. You can't focus on both. That's not how focus works. And the same is true with the Christian life. What are we focused on? Are we focused on the near, the here, the now, what we can have now? Or are we focused on the future? If we're focused on the here and now, we'll lose focus of the future. If we focus on the future, well, that will uh, lose less of a focus on our stuff now. What are you focused on? And I, and I think this, this Bible passage gives us two questions, really, to help us think through where our focus is. We focus on the now or we focus on God's future, which is what we're told to focus on. And the, the two questions, the first question is this, what do you fear? What do you fear? Now, at the start of this passage that we just had read, Jesus had been having a bit of a go at the Pharisees. The, uh, am I on? Am I? Uh, no. Sorry. There we go. Helps if I turn the button on. It, he'd been having to go at the Pharisees, who were like the religious leaders of the time. He calls them hypocrites because they care more about what they look like now than how God's going to see their heart for eternity. And so he's having a go at them in chapter 11, and they decide that they want to get him. They decide that we're going to kill Jesus, actually, and, and we see that's what happens in the end. And Jesus actually says to his followers, his disciples, you're not going to fare much better than me, I'm afraid. People are going to be after you as well. And so Jesus says to them this, he says, I tell you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body and after that can do no more. But I will show you who you can fear. Fear him who, after killing the body, has power to throw you into hell. Yes, I tell you, fear him. You see what Jesus is saying there? He's saying, he's saying to his followers, don't fear what they, these men can do to you in the here and now. Fear what God can do to you in eternity. Put your focus on from now and put your focus on eternal life. And then Jesus actually goes on to say, 
uh, in verse in verse seven that, that if you trust in him there is no fear of god's judgment so verse seven the very hairs of your head are numbered don't be afraid you are worthy more than many sparrows he's saying if you're trusting me if you're forgiven by the father you don't need to fear that eternity but keep focused on it and you won't fear what people can do to you the here and now it's a bit of an irony, isn't there, in this passage. Those who, those who don't fear God now actually have a lot to fear of God in the future. That's what Jesus seems to be saying. But those who have a healthy reverence for God now, those who fear him, who trust him, who follow him, who've trusted Jesus, they have nothing to fear in the future because God has adopted them into his family. Don't focus on the present, focus on the future. And the mark of fearing God more than people is, verse 8, I tell you, whoever acknowledges me before men, the Son of Man will also acknowledge him before the angels of God. The, fear of, the, the mark of fearing God more than men is to be willing to acknowledge God, to talk about him, even if it gets you into trouble. I remember going to a seminar when I was a student and it was about sharing our faith, evangelism. And the guy's got a flip chart out uh, and he, he said, right, give me reasons why you don't tell people about Jesus and, and share the gospel and want to help people understand that Jesus can save them. And we all sort of shouted out our reasons. Uh, and interesting, the ones that came up the most were the fear of rejection fear that people might think we were strange or, or might have a go at us or might not want to be our friends or, or then it might get us into trouble, maybe in the workplace. And all those things might happen. They've happened to me, actually, most of them. But all those things are in the here and now, aren't they? They're in the present. They're temporary. For the Christian, even death is temporary. And we overcome those fears by looking to the future, looking to eternity. We look to a future that is safe for all those who trust Jesus, but a future that's terrifying for those who, who don't trust Jesus, maybe because they haven't heard, maybe because we haven't told them. Proverbs 29, 25, fear of man will prove to be a snare. But whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. I used to help run a, a Christian youth group on a, quite a rough estate. Um, and the parents couldn't be bothered to send their kids to the youth group. So what we did, we, we, we had a, a walking bus used to go around and all the kids used to sort of you know walk behind us and we used to pick them all up and bring them to this youth group and, and be able to have some fun and, and do a, a bible message and the guy who ran this youth group who I helped out was really passionate about sharing the good news about Jesus about helping people know who Jesus was even though the work he did was really hard he got a lot of rejection he got a hard time on this estate he actually chose to live on this estate especially to do that work. And I remember once I was walking along with him and I was, I don't know why, we were talking about hell. And uh, I said to him, I don't really like to think about it. Um, and he said to me, you know what, I think about hell every day. So that's a bit weird, but, but as I, I mulled that through, I think that was partly what motivated him to do what he was doing. It motivated him to bring the good news of Jesus to one of the poorest estates, the roughest estates, the, the hardest job I've, I've come across. Because he, he knew that people need to hear about Jesus and how Jesus died to forgive us and save us. He was future-focused, wasn't he? 
what, what about us? What do we fear? Do we fear what people can do to us now? Or do we look to the future? Do we need to readjust our focus on our binoculars? So that's the first question. That maybe helps us understand where, where's our focus and to readjust our focus. What do we fear? The second question is this, where is your treasure? Where is your treasure? Got a treasure map there with lots of X marks of spots. Where is your treasure? Uh, we met a guy in verse 13 of this passage whose focus was very much on the here and now, wasn't it? So Jesus has just been talking about this future judgment. And this guy wrote, runs up to Jesus. And all he's concerned about is a present judgment. He, he says, uh, he says tell, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He's very much focused on the here and now, isn't he? I want what's mine. And Jesus responds with this parable, this story with, with a meaning. And he actually explains the meaning of the parable before he tells the parable. So he says in verse 15, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So he tells this parable, it's about a rich man who's, who's going to get richer because he's made some good investments uh, and they've paid off. Uh, and so his fields produce this really good crop. He's got enough, he's set for life. So what's his first thought? How can I make sure I enjoy my life? So he prepares for a, a comfortable lifestyle, a comfortable retirement. He builds bigger barns to hoard his wealth so he can retire with plenty. So he can have that nice house in the countryside, that, that those, those holidays, the best food and drink. If we're honest, that's probably what a lot of us are hoping for, aren't we? It's what we're sold in the media. And so he's got all this ready, he's got, he's set for life. Comfortable, happy, everything he needs. And then God says in verse 20, you fool. He says, you're a fool. Why? Well, he's invested in the wrong thing. Because he's about to die. And all his wife, all his... I, all, his, all his wealth, his, his ices, his pension plans, his properties, his shares, they're useless when he dies, aren't they? When he comes face to face with God, none of it matters because it has no eternal value. He's been so focused on accumulating in the present that he's forgotten about the future. He's forgotten, he's neglected eternity. And God says he's a fool. Verse 21, this is the sort of punchline. Jesus says, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself, but is not rich towards God. The Bible tells us there's only one balance that matters, and that is found in a heavenly bank account. That, that bank account is open for us when we put our trust in Jesus. So when we uh, turn to Jesus, when we trust him, uh, that account, that home in heaven is open, it's there, it's waiting for us. But the question is, will we invest in it? Every time we give generously of our time, of our money, of our talents, of our service for Jesus, we're investing in that eternal bank account. And so towards the end of this passage, Jesus says, don't be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom Sell your possessions, give to the poor, provide purses for yourself that will not wear out, a treasure in heaven that will not be exhausted, where no thief comes near and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. 
where is your treasure? The answer to that question will tell us where our focus is, won't it? If our treasure's in the here and now, our heart, our focus will be on the here and now. If our treasure's in heaven, our, our heart, our focus will be on heaven. Are we focused on the here and now, building up our net worth? Or are we focused on building up treasure in heaven, a treasure that can't be removed? I was talking to a, a friend recently about this before I even prepared this sermon. And he said to me, um, most of the time we think every year we should have more and more and more in our bank account every year. But I've been looking at Jesus' words in the Bible and I've been challenged that we, we need to have less every year because we need to increase in generosity each year as we follow Jesus. I found that really challenging. So what will it look like for us to, to build up treasure in heaven? Well, it might be it, it looked like using what we have in the here and now in the light of eternity, won't it? So it might be hospitality, using our, our house, our garden, our money to uh, have fellowship with other Christians and encourage them, or to reach out to those who aren't Christians. It might mean giving more to the church so that we can reach more people with the good news. At Church of the Saviour, uh, we were massively blessed recently that someone died who was a member a long time ago, and they left a massive pot of money <laughs> in, their, in their will. And with that money, we can employ someone to be an urban evangelist, to reach out to people in that estate with the good news about Jesus so that they can be saved for eternity. June Preston, what a lady, investing in eternity and giving that money. I've got a friend who's, uh, who's reduced his work. So rather than working five days a week, he works four days a week. He's sacrificed a day salary so he can spend a day doing stuff for his church. Treasure in heaven. It might be given of our time, our energy. Whatever it is, it will come about if we're focused on the future, not the present. We haven't got time to go into the, the sort of do not worry part of this section of, of the Bible passage now, but, but there is a link. When, when our attitude is focused on a certain future in heaven, the logic is that our present will be released from worry. Can you see how that works? So I wonder why we worry a lot of the time. When we worry, we worry about our future, don't we? Will I have enough? Will my kids have enough? We'll be healthy. We'll be happy. We worry about things we don't really have control of in the future. But when we're future, future focused, when we're focused on eternity, when we know that everything is safe for us in heaven, that puts our worries in perspective, doesn't it? it? Helps us not to be anxious. It, it helps us remember that we can't add a single hour to our life by worrying, but God has our life in his hands and our future in his hands. Being future focused is a cure for worry. So the next couple of weeks, as we sort of look at the future in Luke 12, I hope we're encouraged to focus less on the present and more on God's future. And that as we focus on the future, it changes what we do now. That we wouldn't fear what people say or do to us now. And that we wouldn't hoard in the here and now, but we'd be free. We finish with verse um, 29. 
Jesus says, do not set your heart on what you will eat or drink. Do not worry about it. For the pagan world runs after all such things. And your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom. And these things will be given to you as well. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's pray. Lord, help us um, consider more deeply the future you have in store. Will that motivate us to share the good news with others? Will that motivate us to give generously in the here and now as we build up for ourselves those treasures in heaven? Amen. Amen.